Well, good morning. It's time to start our worship. Let's stand and sing together.
Amen. Well, before you are seated, go ahead and turn around, shake someone's hand, let everybody know that you're glad to see them today. You will have a seat just right where you are. And let me just say, welcome to Rejoice Church on Resurrection Sunday. We are so excited that you are here. And if you're joining with us online, engaging with us through Worship Online, we're excited that you are here with us as well. I mean, Resurrection Sunday is, by the way, without Easter Sunday, we don't have something called a church. It's because of what today represents and what it means for all history and for the church that we have a family like this that we can call brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we're so glad you're here. Uh, my name is Aaron Pontius. I serve as the pastor here at Rejoice Church. And so if there's anything that I can do for you or any of our, of our people I know, we want to serve you in any way if you're visiting. I see a lot of new faces. A lot of you are new to me, for sure. Some of you, this may not be new because you're family and you're visiting, but you're new to me. And I'm excited to see you. So if you are here with us and visiting for the first time or you're visiting with family, we're so glad that you're here. All of you should have received a Connect card. 
Uh, we gave one to everyone. I think we tried to at least when you walked in. And if you got a Connect card, just notice that there's some information on the front or the back. If you're visiting with us, whether you are first-time guest or you are visiting with family, if you are willing, any information that you would give us that you feel comfortable with, we don't want to, we're not going to harass you, I promise, uh, but any information you feel comfortable giving us, we would love to give you a free gift just to say thank you for being with us and worshiping with us and uh, hanging out, even online. If you're first time joining us online, leave a comment. We'll love to reach out to you. Our free gift today is a little book called A Case for Easter. I'll talk more about what this is uh, at the end of the service today. It, it goes along with the things that we're going to talk about today in the sermon, all right? So as we continue in worship this morning, I'm going to read some scripture from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this particular text that I'm going to read from, the Apostle Paul is the author of this book. And he is addressing some things going on in the church. And he, goes, he begins to talk about the resurrection of Christ. And he talks at great length about what it means if he didn't resurrect and what it means for humanity if he really did raise from the dead. And in doing so, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have been believed in vain. And he says, for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. He goes on to say that if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, then we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And then he says that death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together as we continue to worship. Father, we thank you again for your, your grace and your kindness. God, we thank you for the privilege of gathering together. Lord, I know that within this room and even watching online, that there are many who are gathered here who want to celebrate what this day means. Lord, but we're not, it's possible that there could be some here who are here to visit family. There could be some here who are here just because someone invited, whatever, whatever it might be. Lord, there could be some here or watching online that it's tradition to show up on Easter, but maybe aren't sure what they believe when it comes to what this day represents. So, Father, ultimately, we just pray that regardless of, of who receives this message or hears this message today, we pray that our hearts will be open, that, Lord, maybe, just maybe, the things that are recorded in this book, the things that we celebrate today, maybe they really are true. And, Lord, if it's true, what are the implications of this truth in our life? Help us to reflect on these things today. Help us to reflect on the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship the song. Shout out your praise, joy in the house of the Lord. 
the heroes of the faith.
Amen. You can be seated right where you are. Amen. Well, thank you for engaging in worship with us through song and through scripture. And at this time, if there's any kiddos in here that want to participate in kids' worship, you can head back, dismiss yourself out the hall, down the hall to Miss Emily and Miss Casey. I know they're excited to have you this Easter morning. It's awesome seeing a bunch of kids walk out of here. Not that they're leaving. It's just good to see a bunch of kids. <laughs> Well, today commemorates a moment in history that I believe to be, in my opinion, the greatest moment in human history. Easter Sunday is the day that is now used to to reflect on the belief that Jesus of Nazareth resurrected from the dead. They resurrected from the dead. Now, some believe that uh, they don't, maybe they don't believe in something like that, or some may choose to believe that it's just a legend of sorts, and some may even choose to believe that it's a fabrication entirely, but at the heart of the Christian faith is the belief that Jesus of Nazareth, he rose from the dead, and that it's a critical historical event. And there's a belief that it happened in a historical place on a real historical timeline with real historical people. Now, there's incredible evidence to support the death and the alleged resurrection of Jesus, which, by the way, some of those things are in this this book that we're going to give to you. Those are our guests today. There's there's evidence to support that. But what what if this historical event that we're here to celebrate today, what if it was predicted? What if it was foretold centuries before it actually took place? Would that knowledge affect how you see it? If you're here today or watching online and you are a believer, like you, you, you follow Jesus, would the knowledge that these things that we celebrate today was predicted way before it happened, would that deepen your faith, giving you a stronger foundation to stand on? Or if you're a skeptic, you have doubts, you're kind of kicking the tires on faith in general, watching online or in this room, would you... Would you allow that knowledge to at least push you to consider investigating these claims for yourself? Because I believe that the Bible does just that. It provides promises and predictions about a moment in history that would one day come to pass. And that event in history would be would have eternal implications for all people. Right? So today is our fourth week in this sermon series called Fulfilled. And it's our final week. We're, We're wrapping it up today. It's culminating on Easter Sunday. And we've been examining biblical prophecies to see if these prophecies actually came to pass as they were predicted. In the two halves of the Bible, you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. And together it claims to be more than just a reliable record of history. But the Bible actually makes this claim. It makes this claim. It says that it's the Word of God. So the Bible is acknowledging that there is a God who exists that created everything. And it even acknowledges, at least it makes the claim, that the God who made everything spoke to us. And he actually spoke to us through this book. Not just the book, but we can see he spoke to us through creation as well. But we call it special revelation that he revealed himself to us written in this text. That's a pretty bold claim. And I would even say that's an incredibly arrogant claim if it's not true. And so how do you measure that kind of claim? How do you test a claim that says this is the word of God? So we have to be willing to assess or measure that kind of claim by looking at a certain category that's distinct or that's unique to Holy Scripture, that at least make these claims, especially in the Bible. And that's this category of prophecy. So I want you to think of it this way. If a book accurately and repeatedly predicts the future rather than simply record the past, this is what happens. If a book accurately and repeatedly predicts the future rather than simply records the past, well, then it will move from reliable history in its nature to a different category. It will remove, remove from reliable history to divinely inspired in its nature. So the truth test to see if something really is divinely inspired, if that even is a thing, is to look at it and say, okay, does it make predictions about the future? And do those predictions actually come to be as it was predicted? That's what we've been doing in this series. And so far, up to this point in this conversation, in this series, we've investigated a sample size of major historical events, Okay, and that you can that you can corroborate outside of, of the Bible. So ancient history confirms that these things happen. But then we've taken what the Bible does say in the prophetic messages about those events and to see if they have a connection. And 
through that exercise, we've discovered that there were many predictions peppered throughout the Old Testament that happened exactly as they were predicted decades and in some, in some cases centuries later with astounding accuracy. So that led us to the second week, the second part of our conversation was we discovered that the Old Testament is, is it reveals this kind of this veiled promise all throughout, all, all throughout the Old Testament, like this kind of woven through the storyline, the biblical narrative in the Old Testament of this promised one, this Messiah that would come and rescue humanity. And so that led us to ask this question and, and learn, and that was, if this Messiah has showed up already, was there any prophecy that was fulfilled in the way that he showed up? In other words, did he show up in the way that it was predicted he would show up? And then it led us to our third com- piece of the conversation, which is, are there prophecies that was fulfilled, not in the arrival of the Messiah, but in the actual life of the Messiah? And what we discovered was that Scripture is filled with predictions and details concerning this promised one. So, for example, it was predicted that the Messiah would be preceded by a messenger, that this messenger would prepare the way for what this Messiah's ministry would be. And it was even said that this messenger would resemble and the way that he carried himself and the way that he taught the prophet Elijah. It was predicted that the Messiah would exhibit unmatched character traits, like he'd be holy. Not like the self-righteous, um, holier than thou. Maybe we have people in our life that maybe we've been guilty of that ourselves. We kind of, you know, self-righteously say, think we're better than somebody else, right? That's not the kind of holiness that was predicted the Messiah would display. It was actually the holiness, it was the same language used for the holiness of God meaning he'd be loving and, and charitable, he'd be, he'd be giving and gracious and kind, and he'd do all those things perfectly. He'd be perfectly just. It was predicted that the Messiah would perform miracles, that he'd heal the blind, heal the sick, heal the lame. It was even predicted, and this is very specific, that the Messiah's ministry would culminate in the city of Jerusalem, and he would enter being proclaimed as a king, but he would enter on a donkey. That's an odd prediction, but it was a specific prediction. And so when you look at the Old Testament and all the prophetic claims throughout the whole Old Testament, there's 39 books in the Old Testament, what happens is when you begin to put all those prophecies together, we begin to build a profile of what this Messiah is going to look like. And so you can piece those things together and we learn what he's going to be like, how he's going to enter this world, and like even where he's going to be born, and things like where he's going to come from, the kinds of things he's going to do, the kinds of things he's going to see, we're going to see, the signs he's going to display. And so it's this incredibly difficult or, or elaborate and, I would say, high expectation profile. But what we've been doing these last few weeks, and we're going to culminate that today, is we've been looking at the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And when you look at the profile that the Old Testament paints about this promised one, these predictions, and then you match it up with the actual life of Jesus, it fits perfectly. When you look at the birth, when you look at the the life, the ministry, and even the character of Jesus, it fits like a glove. And so I believe that Jesus himself, Jesus of Nazareth, is the one that is referred to as the one that's predicted as the Messiah centuries before his actual birth. And so today, we're going to answer the final question. It's really two questions, but they go hand in hand. If all of this, getting up to this point, we have to address this. Is there prophecy about the death of this Messiah, and does it talk about a resurrection? And if it does exist, if there are prophecies about the death of the Messiah in an alleged resurrection, the second question that goes hand in hand is, can we look at, the, is it possible that those prophecies find its fulfillment in the person of Jesus through his death and his alleged resurrection. That's what I want us to do today, okay? So we're going to kind of move at a fast pace looking at several things, but I think it's going to be, I hope hope it's fun for you. It's fun for me. I'm a nerd. I enjoy this stuff. I hope it's fun for you, okay? So here we go. So the Messiah, it was predicted around his death. I'm going to list these quickly, and then we're going to break them down. That he would be betrayed by a friend, but he'd be betrayed for a specific amount of money. All right? It was predicted that the Messiah would remain silent before his accusers. I don't know about you, but if you are ever accused of something and you know you're innocent, you're probably not going to stay quiet, right? But he, it says he would be falsely accused and remain silent before his accusations. The Messiah's clothes would be gambled away by his executioners. The Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. 
His, he would be mocked ruthlessly. He would be buried in a rich man's tomb, which is odd, but very specific. And he would, but he would uh, after, being, after suffering and being put to death, he would again see the light of life. So we're going to look at these prophecies in the Old Testament and then look at the eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus and see if they match. And if they do, we have to make a decision. Because we've gotten to this point in the conversation, if this ultimately is the reason this Messiah comes is to die, but not just stay dead, but to see the light of life again, and it ends up fitting the life of Jesus, then I think it forces us that hear this message to at least consider what this means for humanity, for us as individuals, okay? So the first thing, that the Messiah would be betrayed, be betrayed by a friend, but he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Now in Psalm 49, King David is the writer of this psalm. And he wrote this around 1,000 B.C. So this is 10 centuries before Jesus walked the streets and was, Jesus of Nazareth walked the streets in first century Palestine. But David is writing about a close friend who betrayed him after sharing a meal together. Okay, so this is foreshadowing something that would take place 1,000 years later. And it says, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread has turned against me. So David wrote this a thousand years before the life of Christ, and it's foreshadowing an event that takes place in the life of Christ. And Matthew talks about how Judas was one of the closest, one of the 12 disciples that Jesus called to follow him. And he betrays him, okay? It even says that he betrays him, um, I'm back, I'm getting ahead of myself. It says that he betrayed him after sharing a meal with Jesus. They share bread together, and it's the meal that that we refer to now as the Last Supper, So after the Last Supper, this is what takes place in Matthew 26. It says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. So going to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. So Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. And then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Now, this isn't very specific because this is a prophecy about a man being betrayed by a friend. Let's be honest, that can happen to anybody, right? But there's more specificity to this prediction than just betrayal. Because you have to ask yourself, what did this man have to gain by betraying a close friend? Someone who cared for him, and he saw him care for others. Well, we actually know he gained 30 pieces of silver for this betrayal, right? Right? Judas was paid 30 pieces of silver exactly for betraying Jesus. Now, interestingly enough, this was something that was prophesied about five centuries before this event took place in the life of Jesus between he and his friend friend Judas. In Zechariah 11, the prophet speaks of a payment involving 30 pieces of silver and of a good shepherd whose service is brought to an end. So in Zechariah 11, this is a vision about a good shepherd, and this is something within that vision that he writes about. It says, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, pay attention to that, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter, notice this, at the house of the Lord. Okay, so this is odd, a little bit unique, kind of a strange thing. Well, 500 years later, this is foreshadowing something that takes place in the life of Jesus. Matthew 26 confirms how much Judas sold Jesus for. It says, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? And so they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Now, what's interesting, I'm not going to read it for uh, for the sake of time, But in the next chapter, Matthew, we learn that Judas was overcome with guilt. It was like to the point that he, it was so stressful um, that he, he knew he betrayed innocent blood. And so he goes back to the chief priest and says, I don't want this anymore. And what he does is he throws, they say, I don't want it, it's blood money. Why do we, what are we going to do with it? And he throws it at the feet in the temple, which is the house of the Lord. So Zechariah mentioned that. And then what we know is that the the chief priest, they took that money and they went and they bought a potter's field to bury people who couldn't couldn't afford to be buried themselves. And so you begin, I said this last week, we can be broad and vague with proclamations about what's going to happen tomorrow. But when you make it very specific, the chances of that happening is very thin, very, very slim. 
And when you begin to make it more specific, the harder it is to fulfill something like that. When you examine these moments and the prophetic claims and you match it up with the things that actually took place in the life of Jesus, it's uncanny accuracy. It's pretty cool stuff. The next prediction, that the Messiah would remain silent before his accusers, something that most of us, I would think, probably wouldn't handle well, especially if we knew we were innocent. It was predicted that the Messiah would be attacked, he'd be rejected, that he would be accused by false witness, but yet he would remain silent, refusing to defend himself when the accusations would come his way. In the book of Isaiah, the prophet, he wrote about a servant of God that would be afflicted and that he would be accused, but he would remain silent like a lamb being led to the slaughter. And Isaiah was written seven centuries before Jesus walked the earth. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So 700 years later, the gospel writers, they testify to a moment where Jesus is about to be crucified. He was falsely accused. He was falsely, uh, unfairly being put on trial, and he did not protest the accusations that were coming towards him. Matthew 27 says, when he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate, who was the Roman governor, asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the, the great amazement of the governor. And then you read John's account of what happened. Look how John testifies to this in John 19. And he went back inside the palace Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And you look, these are specific predictions. Hundreds of years, way before the life of Jesus. And then you look at Jesus himself in these moments. He's accused falsely. Everyone else knows it that doesn't want him to see him die. But yet he And by the way, if you've read any of his teachings, you will learn quickly that Jesus had a way with words like no one ever had. And so if there's anyone that could probably talk eloquently, even though as he's about to be put to death, it would have been Jesus, but he chose to remain silent. It's pretty incredible. Another prediction was that the Messiah's clothes would be gambled away by his executioners. Psalm 22 is a unique psalm because it foreshadows an execution of some sort. And what's interesting, if you read the whole psalm, we're not we're gonna read parts of it, but if you read the whole psalm, it describes kind of a Roman crucifixion. This was a thousand years before Rome was even an empire. And when you read it, there's there's these foreshadowing of what this is gonna happen, what's gonna take place. And in this there's a detail that concerns the clothes of the one being executed. So Psalm 22, it says in verse 17 and 18, says all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So the executed one in this psalm seems to be acknowledging that he is publicly disrobed and his clothing was gambled away by the very ones who were killing him. Well, there's a scene in John 19 where Jesus is being crucified, and this is what it says. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. Now this happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. So John is testifying to this scene where these soldiers, they're just trying to get what they can, trying to kind of fill their own pockets, right? And so they take the garments of Jesus, they they split them in four, and say, hey, let's just equal this out. But then they see the undergarment. The undergarment is actually the most valuable piece of of clothing that Jesus had based on the way they described it. And so they didn't want to tear it because it would devalue it. So they said, hey, let's gamble and see who gets it, right? And John actually testifies saying he himself at least acknowledges he believed that this moment happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And he quotes this 10-century-old prophecy in Psalm 22. Is it coincidental? It doesn't seem like it. You keep going. Another prediction 
is that the Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced. This is one of my favorites because it's so spread out in the Old Testament. Okay? So 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah predicted that the promised Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions. Look at Isaiah 53.5. It says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Okay, so he's acknowledging that this promised one's going to be killed, going to be pierced, okay? But you have another song, or another um, prophecy that's older than that in Psalm 22, where it says, they pierce my hands and my feet. So one prophecy is 700 years before the life of Jesus. Another prophecy is 1,000 years before the life of Jesus. But they are prophesying about the same thing. And so different prophetic claims from different prophetic people at different times in history, but it's about the same thing. One just adds another detail. They're both pierced, but one says in his hands and in his feet. But then there's another one in Zechariah. Zechariah is five centuries before Jesus. So you have spanning from 500 years to 1,000 years, three different prophetic claims from three different prophets at three different moments in history about the same person. But look at how Zechariah describes it. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. So you get all three, they mention he will be pierced. And one adds the detail in his hands and his feet, and one says they will look at him. But, Je- but Zechariah adds this detail about this person. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for the firstborn son. Now, what's interesting about the life of Jesus in this is actually the Scripture does not contain, the New Testament does not have a verse that specifically says they nailed his hands and his feet. Okay? But what it does have is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels confirm that he did die by Roman crucifixion. And historically, we know that the methodology of a Roman crucifixion looks a certain way, and it was very common for them to anchor the criminals to the cross by nailing them to it, okay? So that's a confirmation. But there is a moment in John chapter 20 where the disciples claim to have seen Jesus alive after they saw him die, but one of their friends was not there. His name was Thomas. And he makes a comment as to why he doesn't believe yet. And notice his comment in John 20, 25. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. And so in a comment about doubting, he actually confirms some prophecy that's centuries old. And what's so cool is you see these details about the same kind of prophecy different moments in history from different people, but then you add, you put all the details together and all of them still are fulfilled in a moment in the life of Jesus Christ. Because how Zechariah describes that they will look at the one who's pierced, but he even says, but they'll mourn in a way that's unique. Understand, a cross meant a criminal. And so for someone to die on a cross means they were dying as a criminal. Who do you know would mourn for criminals? Especially they deserved it. Maybe their family, but not a lot of people. What we know from Scripture and from the Gospels' testimonies is that there's even a few scenes in Matthew and John where it says that Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, and it's possible, we don't know for sure, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, could have been at the foot of the cross as well, watching her son take his last breath, and as you can imagine, mourning as if you are mourning over the loss of your firstborn. That's a unique detail mentioned hundreds of years before, all of these add up and are represented in the life of Christ. We're getting through this. Here we go. The Messiah, another prediction is that the Messiah would be mocked ruthlessly. Notice Psalm 22, 7 and 8. It says, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. Now I want you to notice how they mock him. This is, this is the prophecy. He trusts in the Lord, they said. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And so not only do you have a prophecy that the the Messiah will be mocked as he's being executed. That's not really uncommon in the ancient world, by the way. If someone was being put to death, they probably would be ridiculed pretty badly. But it's that it provides the way that this person is going to be mocked. Look at Matthew 27 when this happens to Jesus. It says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. 
In the same way, the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. Now pay attention, verse 43. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And in the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So the Messiah would be mocked ruthlessly. He's getting it from every side. He's being tortured by the soldiers. They're mocking him. He's being, from the, from the leaders of his people, the chief priests and the elders that lead the people in worship are mocking him. But notice the way that they're mocking him. Even the criminals hanging next to him who are dying are teasing him, mocking him. Teasing is not a strong enough word. They are ridiculing him. But notice what it's about because of what he has said and the claims that he follows the one true father. He calls him his heavenly father. Again, unique in the life of Jesus. Two more. And then we'll we'll wrap this up. The prediction that the Messiah would be buried in a rich man's tomb. This is really unique when you consider how people were buried in the ancient Palestinian world. Okay? So the prophet Isaiah wrote about a sinless servant being put to death with the wicked but buried with the rich. And look at Isaiah 53, 9. It says, He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. So this is the kind of man that is perfect, kind of man who's sinless, kind of man who's righteous, who's done nothing wrong. He's innocent here. And it says he would be, he'd die amongst the wicked, but he would be. Well, Jesus was put to death in between two criminals. So he is being put to death with the wicked, but he was buried in a tomb owned by a wealthy man. I'll talk about why that's unique in a second. Look at Matthew 27. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. So going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate ordered that it be given to him. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of this entrance to the tomb, and he went away. Now why is that? It's unique, but why? Because, again, he was killed as a criminal. If you do history, uh, research on the uh, on ancient Rome and how they would conduct these kinds of things, trials of criminals and executions of criminals, you weren't privileged a grave by your choosing. Your family wasn't privileged to pick where they wanted to bury you. You were thrown in a commoner's grave. You were thrown, if it was a tomb, it was filled with dead bodies who had been killed before you. If it was a hole in the ground, it was filled with other criminals who died alongside you. And so it was predicted hundreds of years before that he would die innocent, but die amongst the wicked, but buried with the rich. And you have this unique moment where this rich man, who was a kind of a secret disciple of Jesus, goes to Pilate. Why would he do that? Because he knew Pilate had the jurisdiction and the right as a Roman governor to just get him off the cross, throw him in a commoner's grave. But before they had the opportunity to do that, this wealthy disciple named Joseph from Arimathea says, can I have his body? He says, sure. And he gives him his own tomb that he bought himself that no one had used before. And so when three days later they would go examine, there was no questioning as to, you know, Jesus' body is not there, but what if there were other bodies in there? Because that was common back in the ancient world. This was a brand new tomb. So when that stone was rolled away and they saw nothing was in there, there was no mistaking that that tomb is empty. That's a significant prediction. And then lastly, it was predicted that the Messiah would first suffer and he would die but that he would again see the light of life. Isaiah 53 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. So when you look at the account of the very first Easter Sunday morning, according to Luke's gospel, Luke 24, it says this. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Again, brand new tomb. No one's used it. They would have known, okay? 
While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the death over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. And so you have this prediction of all these things that we've walked through. But then it comes to a moment where it actually says this Messiah will die. He will suffer, he will die, but that he will see the light of life again. And then you read this account, and it's a testimony of what at least was alleged that they saw. Now, we read 1 Corinthians 15 earlier in the service, and I want to go back to two verses from 1 Corinthians 15 to show why this is so substantial and what Paul was talking about when he was saying these things to the church in Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Here we go. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the to the scriptures. So he uses these four words and and saying these four words to describe the life and the burial and the resurrection or the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in saying this, this is what he's acknowledging. Because understand that when he says scriptures, it's not the entire New Testament like we're talking about today. But in their context, he was one of the main writers of the New Testament. So it was being circulated amongst the early church. It was not put together in a complete Bible like you and I have today. So when he says according to the scriptures, what he's talking about is the prophecies. So when he says that he, was, that he died for our sins, what he's saying is he died for our sins according to what was predicted. He says he was buried and he raised on the third day according to what was predicted. That's what he's acknowledging. So by Paul using this phrase, he's telling us that one of the greatest confirmations of the resurrection of Christ is that it occurred exactly as the scriptures has predicted that it would. And what's so funny is that the Old Testament and Jesus himself said this would happen in advance. I say funny, haha, like sarcastically, because Jesus was saying this along his ministry, but people didn't catch it. Three, three examples, quickly. At the beginning of his ministry, John 2.19, Jesus says, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. He's referring to his own body because he was already getting threats. People were jealous. The Pharisees were jealous. They were plotting a way to trap him and kill him. Middle of his ministry, Matthew 12, it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then in his final week of ministry, Jesus makes this prediction about his resurrection. He says in Matthew 17, when they came together in Galilee, he said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. And so when you look at all of this and you put it together, all of this came to pass just as the Old Testament predicted it would. And it all came to pass just as the promised Messiah promised it would. But these are only a handful of the predictions. The Old Testament is filled from all these books, 300 predictions about the Messiah. And I want to give you a quick illustration of how cool and unique this is, and we'll close. So there's a man named Peter Stoner who was a brilliant uh, teacher and scientist, and he, he no longer is alive, but he was once the, uh, make sure I get this right, he was once the former chairman of the Departments of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena, Pasadena City College in California, also the chairman of the Science Division at Westmont College. He wrote a book called Science Speaks. And in that book, the whole point of it was he was wanting to apply the mathematical principle of probability to the various Old Testament prophecies to see if it was, what's the probability from a mathematical perspective that these things could come true in one person, okay? So he tries to apply it. So specifically concerning the the Messianic prophecy, which is what we're talking about, he selected eight of the many predictions in Scripture related to the, the life of Christ and his ministry, and he formulated a mathematical probability of all those things coming true in one man. So his students and himself, they wanted to know the chances that in one man, according to prophecy, that he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he'd be preceded by a messenger before him preparing the way, 
that he would enter Jerusalem proclaiming, being proclaimed as a king but riding a donkey, that he'd be betrayed by a friend, but that he'd be betrayed specifically by a friend for 30 pieces of silver, that he'd be placed on trial, that he would be innocent and make no defense for himself, and that he'd be crucified. Those are the ones that he wanted to see what's the mathematical probability that this could happen on these specific ones in one man. So the chance that any man might live from the day these things were made, these predictions were made, to when they would be fulfilled, he actually calculated an answer. And it is this. He says, the chance calculates to 1 in 10 to the 17th power that this could happen. Now, what does that mean? So that's a lot of zeros if you had 17 zeros, okay? It's a lot. I don't even know the name of that number, all right? But he provides an illustration that would be the equivalent. He said, if you were to take the entire state of Texas and you were to fill it with silver dollars, two feet deep, the entire state, two feet deep, silver dollars, you mark one silver dollar unique, and he stirred up. He said, if you were, the chance that you would take a blindfolded man and he would pick the marked silver dollar is the equivalent that these eight predictions could come true in the life of one man. That's the mathematical probability. But what's cool is that that's only eight through a 300. And you take all of this into account. When you come to this moment, we have to make a decision, right? We're wrapping it up. This decision that, how does this impact me? Like, how should this affect me personally? How does this affect the world? And I'll give you two answers to that. First and foremost, this answers the question we've been wrestling with is, can we really measure the claims that the Bible makes that it's the word of God? And this provides substantial evidence to the validity that the Bible really is the word of God. Because again, the true test of measuring if any book is divine, really divinely inspired, is to say, did it make predictions about the future? And if it did, did those things come true? And so the Bible contains hundreds of prophecy concerning this Messiah that would one day come to pass as predicted. And all of those came to fruition through one person, through Jesus himself. And so when we read the Bible, we can trust that it truly is inspired by God. Now, I'll admit, even as a pastor, the Bible has some tough things to read in it. There's some tough passages, sometimes even hard to interpret. But just because it's difficult in some spots and even difficult for some people to digest does not mean it is not truly inspired by the God who made us. And so when we go to it, we can go to it humbly and say, okay, what does it say? The second thing is this. If this is true, if Jesus truly did fulfill these prophecies, if he really was born of a virgin, if he really did exhibit character that has never been matched in the history of humanity, if Jesus really performed these miracles and provided evidence to demonstrate his divine identity, if Jesus really did raise back to life, then Jesus is exactly who he said he was. And that means he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, he is the Anointed One, and that changes everything for humanity. If this is true, it changes everything for all of us. This means that we... Oh, that, that Christ came to rescue humanity from our sin. And so God is holy, which means God is perfect. Humanity, we're not holy, meaning that we are imperfect, which means that we cannot, by definition, be in the presence of a holy God. Just by definition, okay? And so because of that sin in us, we are indebted to a perfectly just God, right? But God is perfect in everything. See, we can think of people who are very loving, but they might be deficient in patience or kindness or mercy. We can think of people who are very forgiving, but they might be deficient in something else. But God is perfect. So all those qualifications about God's character, he's perfect in all of them. So he is perfectly just, so we are indebted to that justice. But he's perfectly kind. And in that, he provides a way. So knowing that we are indebted to God, knowing that we cannot truly pay this debt, he chose to enter into this messy world as a man to live the life that none of us can live and to pay the debt that none of us can pay. So, so through Jesus' death and his resurrection, God has provided a way for humanity to know him and enjoy him forever. And all of this is fulfilled in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. It's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible. The Bible is unique, and it has evidence to back up why. And so as we close in prayer, 
We're going to sing a song in just a second as well. I just encourage you, if you're a believer here today or watching online, I want you to be encouraged by this. Um, let it strengthen you. Allow, maybe even push you to, to investigate these things for yourself, to, to grow in these things. If you're kind of curious or you're skeptical or doubtful, whatever it might be, first of all, thank you for engaging with us. But let this, are you willing to consider that this could be true? And if it is, how does it impact you? How should it impact you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. God, we thank you for this message of the gospel and the message of Easter. Lord, it's not just a cute holiday that we, that we just gather together to, to hang out. But Lord, it, there's a reason behind it, and it's, and it's substantial. Father, there's tremendous reason why your church, your followers, your sons and daughters believe it's the greatest moment in the history of humanity because it's the moment that you provided a way for all of us to know you and to know you well, to know you intimately and to be reconciled back to you. So Father, I thank, I, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for your word and just the depths of your word. I thank you for friends and family that we're allowed to, to be together like this and to worship and to learn. And I just pray that you'll work in our hearts and our minds. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand. We're going to close one more song and then we'll dismiss in just a moment, okay?
Amen. Well, before we dismiss, a few announcements really quick. I know we have some kids that are anxious to open up some Easter eggs. So um, just real quick, first of all, again, thank you so much for being here. I remind you, everyone should have received a connection card when you came in, even if this is your church home. The reason for that today is if there's anything that maybe you made a decision about or you have questions about, part of that card it gives you the opportunity to check if you have questions about faith, about Christianity, about taking the next steps to, to follow Jesus. And so I just want to encourage you to take advantage of that and let, leave that in your seat if that's something that you want us to, to be aware of. If you're a guest, though, and you'd like to get a free resource, a free book, uh, The Case for Easter, take that connection card out these doors to the table, lay them on there, and grab you one of those, those books. Uh, we'd be happy to give that to you, okay? And then starting next week, for anyone that's, that's interested, uh, we're starting a new series called What is the Purpose of... And I left it blank for a reason. And so we're going to talk about lots of different categories, beginning with the big one. In fact, it's the number one uh, Google completion. If you type in what is the purpose of, the first thing it will complete for you is life. All right? So next week, talking about what's the purpose of life based on what we know from God's word. So we'd love for you to be here for that. Invite any friends or neighbors that would be encouraged by that as well. And then lastly, uh, as we dismiss, if you can give us a few minutes. I don't know if it's raining or not. We'll check. Um, it's not raining. Okay, good. Uh, we'll try to get, get about 10 minutes. We'll get those eggs ready, and then we will give you all some instructions about kiddos getting to hunt as many eggs as they can, okay? All right? So give us a few minutes, and then you guys can, can, can mingle. Let me pray for you, and you can be dismissed. Father, again, we thank you. We praise you. Thank you so much for your, your gift of Jesus. Help us to reflect on that today and celebrate what that means. Lord, as we dismiss in a little while, many of us go into our homes with friends and family to come join us for lunch. We're going out to lunch with friends and family. I pray that you'll bless our conversation, that you'll give us a great time of fellowship, and bless our afternoon. It's in your son's name we pray.